It's kind of like when you're setting up a tent to go camping, right? If you set up all the tent bases and four of them are very, very sturdy and strong, but one of them is really kind of like not stuck in well to the ground, that's going to be the weak point when wind comes and when things kind of blow by it. Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to our YouTube channel. My name is Dave Tilly, and today we are going to chat all about core training. We're going to try to talk about how do you conceptualize and understand the core? What is this thing? What are the components of it? And then more importantly, how do we break down really good, useful, practical training that helps us to carry over to actual functional goals we want to work on? Stick around if you guys want to learn some breakdown of the anatomy and one of my favorite exercises kind of based on the categories that we'll talk about today. If you are new to the channel, welcome. So great to have you. And if you're returning back to the Channel for a break after a while. Welcome back also. Please just go ahead and like and subscribe because we love seeing that people are enjoying these videos. We want to make sure we get more information out to people that you want to learn about. It's less about what we care about and more about what the community needs help with or needs more information on. And these videos have been extremely popular in the last few months we've been doing them. So a huge thank you to everyone who is here, who is listening, who comes in every week, who comments, who tells us what the feedback is. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you like about this video, particularly what you know about future videos you want to hear about or what you might be interested in in terms of tying these things together for ideas down the road. Today, when we talk about core training, I would first just like to highlight that I worked very hard on my stick figures today. I've been getting hilarious DMs and comments about, thank you for the stick figures. I know my handwriting is uh, tough. I'm trying my best to work on it. I need those lines with cursive for like kind of my letters to work on those from grade school. But for now, my stick figures have been seeming to do the trick. I wanna first take a step to this side of the board and kind of break down what do we think about how we conceptualize the core? Because I think unfortunately, between marketing and media and kind of maybe some misinformation, people really think the core is only, you know, the six pack and the obliques. They think it is only related to the actual, you know, show and go muscles as they call them. When in reality, to have the strongest core possible, but also to really train your core optimally, you have to understand the variety of different aspects we have here. I have always found the analogy of kind of a soup can or maybe more of a cylinder that kind of works on pressure top bottom, you know, with the top starting here at the ribs. So if the ribs are going to be more in a good position on top of the pelvis and all the things that attach maybe from the hips and all the way up to the trunk, I consider that all the core. I consider everything from the very top of the thoracic spine all the way down to the hips, the core, and all of the musculature inside of that that helps out. And then your arms and legs kind of work on top of that, right? And I think a really good analogy I like about why core training is so important is because thinking about when you're trying to shoot a cannon, right? The analogy is that a cannon is very strong and the cannon is analogous to your arms and your legs. But if your cannon is on a very unstable base, so say it's on a boat in the middle of a lake, it doesn't matter how hard the cannon can shoot or how far it can shoot because the base is maybe not really the most optimal to set that foundation of strength, right? And so what we need to do is optimize the base, which is the core in this analogy, to be very strong and very stiff and be able to not only you know absorb and transfer force, but also produce force and kind of allow those arms and legs to work optimally. A lot of times in sports, athletics, daily life, people are maybe not focusing on the base. They're only focusing on you know the cannon, which is the arms and the legs. So I think that's a really important analogy to think about, about why we want to work the entire cylinder, because if we have a area that is under trained or is not super developed, that is going to be maybe the weak link and that's going to be the area, right? The other analogy my boss, Mike Reinald, uses is kind of like when you're setting up a tent to go camping, right? If you set up all the tent bases and four of them are very, very sturdy and strong, but one of them is really kind of like not stuck in well to the ground or it's not really, you know, super firm, that's going to be the weak point when wind comes and when things kind of blow by it. So we want to make sure we're training all parts of the tent and we're getting a solid foundation for that cannon to work off of. Just a little bit of an anatomy review or breakdown here. So when you look at the cylinder here, starting at the top and the bottom, I think is actually the most important because they're the most underlooked, right? So the top is going to be a muscle that we use for respiration, but also core control, which is going to be the diaphragm, right? So the diaphragm is kind of like a half a balloon type cylinder that sits on top. And as you breathe in and out, it moves up and down. But you have to remember that the diaphragm is very important for respiration, but it also serves as the top of the canister. So when you can put your ribs down, you can breathe properly, you can have good bracing, that kind of allows the musculature to kind of co-contract and serve as a nice anti-compression nature, right? So on top, you have the diaphragm being that buffer on top to keep that pressure on top, keep the canister kind of lid down and keep pressure contained. But then the bottom, we have the pelvic floor, right? And these are usually the things that people don't really think about too often. It doesn't matter how hard or how strong those muscles work. At the top and the bottom of the canister are not really sturdy, which means you don't have a good pelvis position. You can't keep your ribs stacked on top of your pelvis. You don't understand how to breathe and brace as we'll talk about over here. It's really kind of challenging to work all the other musculature. So above all else, we have to remember that proper breathing patterns and then proper pelvic floor patterns, which I am not an expert in, but if you have issues there, you want to seek out a specialist. 
having those two things work together by being able to just brace and breathe and keep that neutral position of your tension or maybe slight braced arch or slight braced hollow or flex, that's really, really important to maintain really good integrity of the core. Moving on from there, kind of the things that people know more about, right? So in the back, we're gonna have, right, the paraspinals, right? Some other muscles that are a little bit deeper in there, like your iliocostalis, right? The erectors that go deeper down there, but then also all the way deep down into the spine, considering things like the multifidi, the transverse rotaries, things of that nature, right? Those are gonna be very, very important, but that's kind of all the musculature in the back. On the side, which most people know about, we're gonna have the internal obliques and the external obliques, right? Which are just muscles that kind of start from the ribs and some go blend down this way, right into the uh, more external part. But then you have all the cross fibers that go the other 45 degrees that start from the hips and wrap your way up. They attach to the midline of the linea alba, which is where the rectus abdominis kind of has pieces too. But they have very broad attachments, right? They go all the way from your ribs, all the way down your pelvis, and they kind of cross hatch in a pattern like this. So they allow for not only lateral support of the ribs, but they also kind of help to buffer some of the forces as well. In the front, we have two kind of layers to think about here. So one is that we have the transverse abdominis, which is much more deeper into the spine. It's kind of a broader, flatter muscle. And its role really is to compress the organs and keep that stiffness in the front and kind of act as a little bit of a, a harness to kind of tighten everything up when you breathe and you brace together. I think the old mentality was that we had to do really aggressive draw-ins and get the transverse abdominis activated, which I guess will recruit that. But what we know now from other people's work like Leon Chateau and some other breathing experts is that when we have proper bracing and breathing, we kind of get some reflective activation of the transverse abdominis to kind of bolster and buffer against some of those forces because the pressure then kind of goes from the inhale, the pressure moves down, kind of bounces back off the pelvic floor and expands out to the ribs. So when we brace and we get a nice tight bracing position, whether we're doing something where we want to exhale and breathe out right and push the belly out for like power lifting, or we're doing some sort of gymnastics or recreational weightlifting, stuff like that, we want to get the transverse abdominis activated by doing some of those proper breathing and bracing patterns. On top of the transverse abdominis is going to be the rectus, right, abdominis, which most people know as like the six pack, but that's kind of what you see on the very, very front if someone is lean. So we kind of have all of these layers together working in conjunction with each other, right? The top and the bottom, the back and the front, those two layers in the front, and then we have the lateral uh, musculature as well. And you could even make that argument that you have more of a deep column close to the spine, which is again, multifidi, the rotary, stuff like that, that kind of stabilize intersegmentally between the two, um, and then go all the way back out and kind of expand out into the outer layer, which is kind of what we're talking about now. The reason I wanted to go through this very in-depth explanation is because it sets the stage for how I think we should program for a lot of core training. And I think that the traditional way to kind of think about core training is what we call anti-movements, right? Which we'll talk about here. So anti-flexion and anti-extension to work these musculatures, but also there is a little bit of a role to play in sports for like moving positions, right? So I work in gymnastics a lot or circus and they actually need compression strength. So the actual flexion of the front of the abs and compression strength is important for their skill to work on just as much as the anti-movement. So I think sometimes, you know, the sports get too carried away with only doing the moving side of things like throwing or jumping or running or sprinting. Whereas the strength conditioning world sometimes gets a little bit too carried away or the medical world gets too carried away with the anti-extension, anti-flexion, stuff like that. And in reality, both are really, really important and you want to train both. All right. And so when we move over to the actual training side, I think the one thing that a lot of people jump to is again, those show and go muscles like the six pack, the oblique, stuff like that. And I really think the first place to start is the bracing and breathing concept. And so what I like to tell people is that we first want to understand position, the ability to arch, the ability to hollow or kind of anterior and posterior pelvic tilt. Popularized contact by my friend, Mike Reinold is that the idea about bracing and breathing after you learn position. So, and you find your neutral position in space, right? And then from there, do you know how to brace the entire core section together and breathe on top of that? Because again, that's where that diaphragm, the pelvic floor helps to foster some of this co-contraction. I really like just having people go on their back first with their knees bent up and just putting their hands on their ribs, putting one hand on their stomach and one hand on their chest and bracing nice and tight and breathing and trying to move the lower hand, the stomach hand more than the chest hand. We don't want to go brace and breathe and have and breathe and move the ribs up a lot. We want to try to push that air into the stomach to get some of that transverse abdominis recruitment and some of the obliques and some of the top and bottom of the cylinder working together. So first start with bracing and breathing. And then once you go into the actual training piece, thinking about again, the anti-movements or the actual moving, right? So the anti-movements I really like, is just going to be a prone hold, right? So kind of just having someone or having you hook your feet on a bench, put yourself flat out maybe on a GHD or on a block, and you're just holding an isometric hold with maybe your arms crossed or your arms up or a weight in your hands, right? just holding that actual motion of holding a plank where your stomach is down and you're extended off that way, right? The other thing that is really, really good to do here in conjunction with the moving stuff is you can actually do some like GHD extensions where you're not trying to arch formally from your back, but you get some of that back lumbar motion. You can do a little bit of back extensions, which I think kind of count as a little bit of both, but also you could just do some of the more traditional kind of gymnastics work, which is just an arch hold, right? Laying on your stomach and just trying to tighten up that body, arch and do a Superman and then relax. I would really be cautioning about those if someone has some low back discomfort, but you have to understand again, 
again, how to brace the entire core in arch up and not just crank on your back and arch up. So my preferred method is going to be the prone hold and back extensions. But if someone trains in a sport like gymnastics or something that involves a lot of arching motion, they need that to be successful. We like to work some segmented arch training and stuff like that. You can use uppers and lowers. You can put a stick in their hands and work on that thoracic extension as well. But I think those are really, really good. Okay, on the side, again, you can do lateral pillar holds, right? Which is kind of when you lock your feet into a bench and hold sideways, maybe again, off of a bench, off of a GHD, something of that nature. And then also just traditional, you know, just side planks. Side planks trying to work on, you know, bent knees at first to kind of keep a shorter lever arm and then opening up the legs more to be completely straight. And the progression is lifting the top leg up all the way and holding. You can add a rowing component onto it. A lot of different stuff you can kind of work on as well. Okay, but the other thing we have to think about here is kind of be mixing front and side together is going to be anti-rotational movements as well. So within the side, you have anti-lateral bending, right, which goes in the side, whereas this is going to be more anti-flexion, right? The back is anti-flexion, anti-side bending might be here, and then anti-rotation gets mixed in with the front as well. So I also like to do things like plank drag throughs, which kind of blend into the front, right? Because again, you're in a front plank, but you're also working on shifting side to side. I do enjoy some of that stuff as well. Okay, so you can kind of work together on the anti-rotation of the plank drag through. I really like anti-rotational press outs, half kneeling press outs as well, right? And then over here on the side, you can also do suitcase carries. I think those are a really great way that kind of blends compression as we'll get to as well. But I think that suitcase carries are a phenomenal way to kind of do like a walking side plank, right? The heaviest weight you can pick up with high quality, keep your pelvis neutral, keep your trunk neutral, walking straight ahead and trying not to tip side to side. Okay, so those are really, really good. And then on the actual moving side, again, for sports that demand that requirement, you know, doing some side plank dips, right? So just being on your side and kind of doing some side planks up and down, because sometimes athletes do need to rotate and actually move through those things. I think there's an argument here where you could say that Russian twist done in the proper pattern, right? And by proper pattern, I mean, not actually torquing from your spine, but keeping yourself nice and braced and just having slight rotation of your hips and of your torso together. Again, for sports that need that, that have a little bit of rotational components, I'm thinking gymnastics, I'm thinking a little bit around rotational hitting sports. Like you want to use your hips, your thoracic spine, your shoulder, but you do need to train a little bit of rotational work and bracing in that side to side motion to get the obliques to help transfer force. Side plank dips are really good. I think that Russian twists are really good. And also I really like some of the stuff we do at Champion, getting someone in a rotational strap around their hips and teaching them how to move and rotate from their hips just a little bit. So like, you know, chops and lifts and things of that nature. So chops in a half kneeling, right? Or lifts in a half kneeling or tall kneeling position based on kind of what the goal is. Those are all fantastic ways to train, again, the anti-side bending, but also the anti-rotational aspects of it. For the front, which is what most people kind of know about, I think for the anti-motion, so this will be anti-extension, right? I actually think some of the more basic ones, like a dead bug, a wall press dead bug, are a very, very good place to start. I also think things like a bear crawl. A bear crawl would be really, really good because that's going to teach someone to brace on hands and knees and not kind of drop into that very over arched position, right? Dead bugs might go uh, in this category. Bear crawls might go here. Bird dogs might go up here actually in the back category. I forgot to put that one, which is another great one popularized by Stuart McGill. So doing a little bit of bird dogs there, right? I think those two are good for dead bug uh, bear crawl. I also really like doing some more advanced training from Stuart McGill that he's popularized in research studies. So a stir the pot, right? Or just a hard style plank, sometimes people call them. Stir the pot is up on a physio ball, 10 circles to the left, 10 circles to the right. You can start on your knees. You can start on your feet. Really like those as well. Hard style planks are when your legs are really pressing into the wall and you're max tension. You're really trying to drive as much of that nice core control and that max threshold work as you can. Again, these are more static. They're not really moving, right? But then I talked about in the gymnastics world, some of the artistic sports really do need a little bit. So we can do a reverse crunch, right? And then we could also do some sort of a leg lift kind of progression or an L hold. Those are also really good as well, right? So reverse crunches, you put something behind your knees and kind of tug that and you work on following up and bringing your knees all the way back up to doing a little bit of a backwards roll aspect. Leg lift, you hang, you can start with a tuck knee, you can start with one leg, you can start with two legs, all the way up to really fancy versions of like leg lift up to L compressions and candlestick hold. And then an L hold, you can start on parallettes. You can start on a tuck hold. You can start on a one leg hold. Lots of different options here. I think both of these are really, really valuable for someone trying to get the most out of the front of their core. And then lastly down here is compression and traction, right? Those forces, again, compressing the cylinder, traction of the cylinder are both really, really important, especially for sports. Anything on the compression side is going to be plyo based, right? So, you know, low level hurdle hops or box jumps or depth jumps, reaction jumps, single leg pogo hops. Most of that stuff comes from more of that high ground impact that you have to work on bracing, breathing, and being really, really stiff and not letting your back kind of move into your arch or too much into a tuck. Slowly progress by small, medium, and higher plyo. So hurdle stuff is really good. Box jump, depth jumps is really, really good. Reactive depth jumps, you know, vertical jumps, all that kind of stuff. Seated dumbbell jumps. I really love all those as well. And then traction on the other side typically only comes with uh, hanging sports. So weighted pull-ups are probably the most common one that some people are going to see in the general fitness side, but then on the actual gymnastics or aerials or stuff like that, you'll see tap swings, you'll see some rope climbs, you'll see some bouncing drills and stuff like that. So a little bit more rare, but I think that that definitely is a very important factor to think about how you compress and breathe and brace under load for those kind of sports.
a little bit of a longer one here today, but I hope that this was really helpful. I think that, you know, this could be an entire weekend course on itself, but I just quickly want to give people a little bit of a rundown of, you know, my experiences as a coach, a medical provider, as a researcher, stuff like that, about what goes into some of these pieces. And I think it's really important to conceptualize again this piece of it and think about how does this practically apply? How do I program for someone? How do I program for myself? How do I work with athletes that I coach or hang out with? And I think that this wraps it up really well. So if you guys enjoyed this video, do us a huge favor again, drop in the comments below. What did you like about this? Are there other exercises that you enjoy for these things? You think that something I talked about is maybe off the mark and you want clarification? Happy to chat about that in the comment section, but also let us know what you want to learn about in the future. If you really like these concepts and want to expand more on maybe individual videos for these things, we can totally do that. I think it's really important to sometimes just take the basic concepts and apply them to people. Can you brace and breathe? Do you know your core is in space? Can you lay down and brace and breathe and then add basic arm and leg movements, especially for younger athletes that are maybe having a tough time engaging their core? I think those are all really, really important factors. Do us a favor, like and subscribe so you get notifications for all the future episodes and we hope to see you in the next one. Thank you.